All right, welcome everyone to episode two of the Space Prize Speaker Series. It is May 4th, 2022, and I will once again say May the 4th be with you. Um, we have a small live audience today, but I'm hoping you guys will be uh, participatory and ask questions and so forth. Um, I'll go over the norms in a minute. And of course, this is being recorded for the Space Prize Foundation. Uh, so we're definitely thinking in terms of a student population, particularly young women. But I uh, hope some of the educators here will ask some, uh, some great questions as we go. Uh, I'm Dr. Mark Wagner. I'm the, the president of the Space Prize Foundation. And I am uh, going to say a few words about Space Prize to kick off the, uh, the session. But then I'm going to hand it off to our host, Dr. Leslie Anderson, who I will um, introduce a little bit more fully in just a moment. But first, a few words about Space Prize. We are a very near completion of our first Space Prize Challenge, the New York City Challenge. Uh, in that challenge, the students from five public high schools in New York City, in the five boroughs of the city, uh, completed a essay contest in January. The finalists from the essay round went on to a video contest in February, and we had our judging at the beginning of March. Uh, since then, the, uh, the girls involved have had a number of really great experiences. All of the finalists got to participate in a simulated mission to Mars at the Challenger Center in Manhattan. Um, they also, this was a fantastic bonus, got their uh, faces up on a massive Times Square billboard uh, for about a week. Uh, you can imagine for uh, kids in the New York City public school system, this was a pretty big deal. Uh, we're talking grandparents called in from out of town to see it and that kind of thing. Um, we also were able to send four of the winners to Space Camp's new leadership program called LIFT. So they took part in that April uh, 8th through 10th this year, right before our uh, Yuri's Night celebration in New York. And five of the winners will be on a zero G flight in just a couple of weeks here on May 28th. Uh, all of the winners will also be paired, or are already paired, uh, with an influential woman in the space industry, and we'll be working with them every month for a year. So it's an ongoing uh, experience. To learn more about the uh, other challenges coming up from Space Prize, just head on over to spraceprize.org. We're working on a number of regional challenges uh, and shorter term challenges before working our way up to the, uh, the global challenge that we've talked about for so long. One of the questions that drives us, though, is what are we doing for the young women that don't win the contest? Uh, and this is easily uh, expanded into what are we doing for students and educators everywhere. Uh, we are uh, developing a community platform and a uh, ambitious uh, space education curriculum, which we'll begin releasing this summer, uh, next month, actually. Uh, and we've begun a speaker series, uh, of which this is the second episode, uh, featuring uh, mostly women, but also some men from across the space industry in a variety of roles. So astronauts, engineers, scientists, entrepreneurs, designers, lawyers, artists, historians, and, uh, and many, many more. Uh, we'll have some space philosophers and uh, really get to dig into some great topics. So uh, we're thrilled to uh, be here with you today. And we do have a small live audience. So uh, just real quickly with a group this small, it's not that big of a deal, but participation norms. Everybody, please do participate in the chat. We hope you guys will um, ask questions, answer each other's questions, uh, whatever you like, share resources, that kind of thing as we go. Uh, and then also feel free to use the raise hand feature using the button at the bottom of your screen. Um, or in this case, just go ahead and interrupt because there's not too many of us here. Uh, and then feel free to unmute and share screen if, uh, if that becomes a factor too, uh, particularly if you're invited to. So. We don't want anybody to be disruptive, but uh, but we definitely want to be able to uh, make it a conversation. So, uh, if you need any help, uh, just you know, raise your hand or text me or uh, use the help feature, which will also just send me a text as the host of the uh, of the event. Now, I want to introduce uh, Dr. Leslie Anderson, our host of the series. Uh, she's a uh, she has been a high school uh, science teacher. She has. Uh, been on a number of scientific adventures, uh, tracking um, sharks around the world, going on a polar trek to the South Pole. Uh, she has worked at JPL. She's currently on a fellowship in Washington, D.C. at the Library of Congress uh, through the Einstein Distinguished Educator Fellowship. 
Um, and she's working with us also on the curriculum I mentioned at Space Prize. So really thrilled to uh, have Leslie here to lead this series of interviews and I'm gonna turn it over to her. But I'll put up the next slide for you, Leslie, and I'll pull the slides down when we get into the discussion. Thank you so much, Mark. I have the privilege and pleasure of introducing Susie to our group today. So Susie is a space plasma physicist, a high altitude mountaineer and explorer, and maybe one day an astronaut. Her area of expertise is space weather, studying the interaction of the solar wind on the planets in our solar system. And she is currently involved in the Bepi Colombo mission to Mercury, which launched on October 20th, 2018, and will go into orbit around Mercury in December, 2025. Susie has also written computer code to run on a supercomputer to automatically identify mountains in the Andes and Himalayas. And as a result of discovering many unclimbed mountains using her code, she set off with her climbing partner, Max, every year to, be, to make first ascents of high mountains in some of the most remote regions on the planet. Susie won the 2017 BBC2 series, Astronauts, Do You Have What It Takes? A BBC series, science series where 12 candidates were selected from thousands of applicants and put through their places by Canadian astronaut, Chris Hadfield. After dozens of grueling tests and a selection process lasting several months, Susie was selected the winner and has Chris Hadfield's backing for her astronaut application the next time the European Space Agency puts a call for astronauts. Susie, welcome. Thank you so much for taking time today to, to speak with us. Um, I just want to first ask, can you tell us a little bit about your current work? Yeah, of course. So uh, I, I, I just was described as a space plasma physicist, which means a lot to me, but may not mean a lot to everybody else on the call. So what does that mean? Um, in essence, what I look at is the sun and what's happening on the sun. The sun is variable. It's not always the same. And that variability leads to variability in the space between the sun and the planets called the interstellar uh, called the interplanetary um, magnetic field and the interplanetary environment and my job is basically like a weather forecaster i look at the sun i try and see what it's doing and then i try to predict when that big event that big explosion from the solar surface that i picked out that looked interesting if that smashes into the earth or into one of the planets what's the impact of that so we basically are like weather forecasters our weather comes from the sun and we try and work out what the impact is on the planets and i really specialize in the inner planets we call them the terrestrial planets which just means the rocky planets the inner four planets so what does a day normally look like for a space weather forecaster you know, every my job is is has lots of different aspects. And so that's one little piece of it. <laughs> and that might mean uh, I have PhD students, I have master's students. Um, so it might be, you know, looking at data with them or doing doing a little bit of research. But actually, one of the things I really like about my job, I work at the university, I should say that I work at the University of Leicester. Um, and I'm adjunct faculty at the University of Michigan, but I spend most of my year, especially, you know, since the pandemic, uh, in Leicester at the university and so I teach undergraduates so sometimes I have a few hours of teaching a day and then I'll do a bit of research and then I'll go and do some outreach and then I'll head off to sit on a panel looking at what future missions might look like and which ones we should select and so I really you know it's every day is different and that's a sort of real highlight I think of my job but something I really enjoy. How did you get into this field? It seems like a very niche, um, particular place to go into. How did you know about this? You know, we're not in high demand. There aren't many places I can work in the UK. Um, it is really niche as an area. Um, I, yeah, I, I didn't really, so when I was in high school, I guess I should go back to that kind of time period. When I was in high school, like many of the people that might be watching or, you know, some of the teachers might have students of that age, I was kind of mediocre. So I was middle, middle division for science, which in the UK basically means kind of middle of the road. Uh, and I harbored no particular desire to be a scientist or anything else, really. I wanted to be an explorer, actually. I wanted to go to Antarctica. So I want to hear more about Leslie's antics in Antarctica. Um, and but I really enjoyed physics and I really enjoyed maths, um, particularly maths, actually as a language as a tool for understanding the world around us and so as i in the uk system you specialize when you're 16 years old in three subjects that's it that's all you have to study just three so i well i studied maths further maths physics and chemistry so uh, i did four but the extra one was a bit more maths because i really like maths 
Um, and there's pluses and minuses to that. Some of the students listening are going to say, wow, I wish I could ditch a load of things I hate. And some of the others are going to say, wait, you've only studied three. What about everything else? So it's, you know, it's a different system, I think, to yours, as I understand it. But I chose all these mathematics sort of subjects. And again, like I was OK, doing all right. Uh, decided I really love physics and went to physics degree and kind of built an interest in space really from there. You know, I, I, I'd read a couple of books from a long time ago, you know, when there weren't so many popular science books. And I read a book by an amazing British physicist called Stephen Hawking who some of you might be familiar with. It's probably one of the most famous scientists of our era, uh, who has done a microgravity flight, actually, um, which is interesting. So, uh, yeah, so he uh, he wrote a book called A Brief History of Time, which is a very, very famous book. Uh, and I didn't understand a word of it. Like, I was interested and I, like, I liked reading it, but I didn't really get it. And I think if I read it now, I probably wouldn't really understand it. Now I'm a professor of physics, so it was, it was hard. But it got me kind of interested and I thought I wanted to be an astrophysicist because it sounded cool and I'd read this book and it was all about sort of astronomy and, and uh, well more about cosmology actually and the structure of the universe and then uh, I applied to NASA to be an intern and they accepted me for two summers I went to work at Goddard Space Flight Center on the east coast uh, near, near Washington DC near where Leslie is actually um, and I uh, they put me in the heliophysics division so they put me in the planetary science division not the uh, astrophysics or astronomy department. And I just, it kind of, you know, just really went from there. I was just really interested in the work that I was doing. And I recognized, and then maybe I'm going to convert some people today, but, you know, astronomy is great. And we look at things far away. We make predictions. We do theory. We look through telescopes. We do modeling. But if you're a planetary scientist, you do all of that. And then you design a mission and you build it and you launch it to the place that you're trying to study. And to me, the connection between being able to build something to answer the questions that you're interested in, that's that's pretty powerful to me. I like to know whether or not my theory was correct, you know? And I'm not saying astronomers never know that, but uh, it's very satisfying to be involved in building spacecraft and be part of that, I think. So let me ask you, how is space weather relevant to people on Earth? Yeah, great question, actually, a really good question. And I kind of get that all the time, people sort of saying, why do we care about the weather in space, you know? Um, so it actually has really profound implications for life on Earth, or it can do, but it doesn't do very frequently. And that's our challenge. So um, the, the biggest ever space weather event, some of you might have heard of, it's called the Carrington event. So that name might be familiar, again, named after a famous scientist, but it was in the 1850s. So a long time ago, a century and a half ago, and there was this massive explosion on the sun. And that explosion traveled out and smashed into the Earth, the Earth's magnetic field. Um, and at that time, they weren't that dependent on technology. So the only thing they noticed was that some people operating um, telegraphs uh, got electric shocks in their ears. OK, this is slightly strange. People are getting electric shocks in their ears. They didn't die, I don't think, or anything. But, you know, it's kind of noticeable. Something strange had happened. Um, uh, and people looking at the sun saw some interesting things as well, but that was the extent of it. This, if this happened today, would be absolutely catastrophic um, because we depend so much on technology. So um, we have fleets of satellites orbiting the Earth and big events, they damage satellites. They can even make satellites deorbit because they increase atmospheric drag. So they heat the atmosphere, the atmosphere expands upwards, satellite flying through it feels greater drag greater resistance and then it can change its, its altitude profile. Uh, we can get massive currents way above the atmosphere in a region called the ionosphere, above the atmosphere. I'm trying to wave where you can see my hand. Above the atmosphere, we have a region called the ionosphere, which is a, a region of charged particles and a plasma. And uh, space weather, the interaction of this uh, big event from the sun, the magnetic field coming from the sun with the Earth's magnetic field produces massive currents that flow above the atmosphere. And for those of you doing physics, you'll know that if you have a massive current flowing uh, somewhere in the ionosphere, for example, anything long and metallic on the Earth's surface will feel an induced uh, current will flow in that object. So anything long and metallic will have a current flowing along it as a result. And so a good example would be um, the power grid. We have massive long power lines that stretch for long, long distances that are made of metal. So we get currents flowing in those power lines and that can um, alter the harmonics of the power grid, but also blow transformers in the system. So we would have uh, GPS malfunctions, 
uh, we would have sort of mass um, problems with, with any satellite orbiting. Actually, astronauts would get a high radiation. Uh, communication systems would fail. We'd have to reroute all planes uh, that, that were heading towards the high latitudes. So, it, I mean, people have likened a massive space weather event to akin to, to uh, you know, a war in the impact that it would have because the destruction would be widespread and would last months. So imagine we lose our power for months. Like, you know, we have power cuts and we get a bit annoyed when we lose our power for a couple of days because our deep freeze defrosts uh, and, you know, we have issues. But huge Carrington event would cause far more disruption. The challenge, of course, is that we don't know when one is coming. So we have these big events, massive events, we think maybe like once a century, smaller events more frequently that are more localized. Um, and my job is to try to understand the physics behind what's happening so that if we happen to see a big event coming from the sun, we would know or be able to forecast which regions would be most affected and we would know how to protect our infrastructure and maybe design infrastructure that's more resilient to space weather events. So that's kind of the heart of, of, of what I do. And, and I studied the planet Mercury specifically as a parallel to studying the Earth because Mercury sits really close to the sun. And it has very weak protection from space weather because it's got a very weak magnetic field. And so it experiences a Carrington size event basically every day. So I only get to study one at the Earth every century or every two centuries. That's not great. But if I can study one at Mercury every day and I can understand the physics behind these events, then I can apply that knowledge to the Earth. And that's why Mercury and the Earth are such interesting parallels. That is fascinating. And I have a thousand other questions that I've had just because I've never heard of the Carrington <laughs> event before. So now I want to go. Oh, wow. Well, there you go. Something to Google. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I hit Google right away and shared a link in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> so my question is, I mean, it's wonderful to be able to forecast this, but are, are there things that we can do to prevent this? And are there organizations that you work with or agencies that you're connecting and collaborating with? If you do have a forecasted or projected event, who might you be working with to kind of protect us from that yeah so basically there's nothing we can do about, about what comes from the sun like that's that's just gonna happen uh and we're gonna watch it come towards us so the best thing we can do is see it happen and accurately model its trajectory to work out is it going to impact the earth because a lot of these we see them happening but they, they're not coming towards the earth so they're not going to be harmful to us so get as much warning as we can that's great um, the, the solar wind normally travels around 400 kilometers a second, which means it takes about three days, two or three days for a piece of the solar wind to leave the sun and reach the earth. But these events, as you can imagine, they're explosive, so they are high speed. So they'll get to us in about a day. Um, we have a satellite that sits at something called the Lagrange point. Um, the Lagrange point actually is super interesting. It sits between the Earth and the Sun, and it's like a point of miniature stability. So you can have a spacecraft that sits just upstream of the Earth. It's thinking about the gravity of the Sun. The Sun's got much more mass and so a greater gravitational pull than the Earth. But if you sit your spacecraft at a specific distance between the Earth and the Sun, it's getting kind of equal pull from both. Um, we can't sit at a point, so we sort of orbit around this point. But anyway, it's really, there are five Lagrange points around the Earth, super interesting places where we put satellites that stay there. And so there's one upstream of the Earth, it'll give us an hour's warning of what's about to hit us. And that's our kind of last minute, this is the last thing it's gonna hit before it hits us, we have an hour's warning. So what are we gonna do about it? I make it sound very dramatic, it doesn't happen very often, but uh, what are we gonna do about it? We're going to, Think about how we design systems, think about how we design power grids. You know, in, in the UK, we're quite lucky because we're quite small and our power grids, while they're pretty old, they don't span massive distances in the same way that they do in other parts of the world. So accidentally, we end up being a little bit more resilient to it. Um, we can look at particular regions that are going to be more affected. And so up towards the pole, the magnetic poles we see more effects. Um, if you think about it, you've probably seen the aurora or photos of the aurora borealis or australis, the northern lights and the southern lights. This is to do with space weather. Space weather drives these bright uh, displays of light in the sky. The same thing that drives the aurora also drives the damage. So um, those regions where you might go and see the aurora, northern Scandinavia, for example, Canada, those sort of latitudes in the northern hemisphere, those are the places most likely to be affected although big events will come further south and affect the US and the UK as well. So understanding where the places are that are most likely to be affected, 
Um, and what we can do, you know, can we do something with our satellites? Can we switch our satellites into a mode where they're safer so they can better withstand these high energy particles that are about to come their way? So it's not about stopping what's coming from the sun because that isn't going to happen, but it's all about understanding how to deal with it when it reaches us. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah. And I'm, I'm going to switch directions a little bit, but I just want to invite our, our guests that are on um, this call as well. If you have questions that you'd like to put in the chat or if you'd like to unmute yourself and use the raise your hand, please feel free to do that. Um, but I really want to learn a little bit more about your experience um, on the BBC series and telling us about what was it like to have to go through that grueling astronaut training and, and what is kind of your future expectation and hopes for, for space travel or getting to maybe be an astronaut one day? I guess I should start by saying that uh, this was a total accident that happened that wasn't intentional and it wasn't a plan of mine. Um, I was climbing in the Andes and I've been away for a few months climbing in the high mountains and it came down to a place called Fiambala in Argentina to get food and fuel and just like sleep one night in a bed before going back again. You can't stay down too long or you don't want to go back up again because it's really brutal up there. So it just came down for one day. And um, I went to the village square of Fiambala, which is a place of a few thousand people in remote Argentina. And the village square in Fiambala has free public Wi-Fi, which, you know, Leicester doesn't have free public Wi-Fi where I live in the UK. So, you know, this is this is amazing. So I opened up my laptop and like thousands of emails poured in because I've been gone for months. And one of them was from the BBC saying, do you want to be an astronaut? And I remember reading this email and being like, ah, uh, I don't know what this is about. Uh, but it was all about a reality television show that they had decided to commission. And they were looking for participants. They were looking for people to apply to be part of it. Um, and I didn't have a television at the time. I still don't have a television or any interest in television, particularly like I never, I was really happy in my office at the university, just doing my thing, you know, no desire to be on television. And, but I read this email and it sort of promised some interesting things. So it promised an astronaut selection process and it included things like, you know, if you do well, you might get to go on a microgravity flight, or if you do well, you might get to go on a centrifuge. And I was thinking to myself like, huh, okay, this sounds fun. Maybe it's worth a go, you know, maybe I was obviously I've been up high for a long time. Maybe my brain was a bit starved of oxygen. So I wrote them an email and said, hi, my name's Susie. I'm a planetary scientist. This sounds fun. You know, I don't know what you need from me, but you know, I'm an athlete and I, I love climbing mountains and I'm, I'm a scientist. And uh, they tried to contact me back and got this like auto auto response saying, sorry, I'm climbing for the next two months. Uh, get back to me in January or whatever. And so we had a conversation and and I was really nervous about the whole process because I had some idea in my mind about reality television. But at that point, it was just I don't know if you have Big Brother in the US, but in the UK, the show called Big Brother was a thing. And that's the only thing I'd ever heard of. And frankly, that is a terrifying prospect. Um, and so I had this kind of massive fear about about the whole thing. And I spoke to my mom. I got obviously, what's the first thing you do? You go to your mom and you say, Mom, what do you reckon about this? And my mom was like, No, don't do it. She said, you know, it's gonna be like the only thing we knew, which was Big Brother. They're gonna put you in a room with people that will not get along, kind of, you know, on purpose. And then they're gonna set you some physics questions and you'll fail the physics questions. I remember thinking like, oh, thanks mom. Uh, and then she's like, you'll, you know, you'll get kicked out and you'll go back to the university and they'll disown you because you're rubbish at physics on national television. She's like, it's the end of all things. And I remember thinking like, wow, that wasn't how I saw it happening, but okay. Uh, and, uh, and then they sent us to have an, like through the interview process to be part of it because they had thousands of applicants. They sent us to a psychologist and the psychologist was, was talking to us, you know, what are the, what is the impact of being on television? What might happen? You know, you need to think through the consequences. And one thing I've followed quite closely since then, which was 2017, is what happens to people at the end of a process like that. So they go on television, it's wild and crazy and things happen and they're unpredictable. And then the whole thing ends. And it's really, you know, difficult for people's mental health to cope with both the scrutiny, public scrutiny, um, the social media aspect, the fact that people are pretty nasty on social media, um, the fact that it's out of your control. So they can put whatever they want. They take all this film for months at a time and then they make it into a story. And so I make it sound really negative, but that was my own sort of personal anxiety about the whole thing. But I went to talk to the producers and um, they're from the BBC. 
BBC Science, nothing gives me confidence like BBC Science. You know, they they were saying this is a serious thing. You know, we're not going to set you up. We want it to be inspirational and aspirational for young people and families across the UK to kind of show them what you can do if you put your mind to it. And and so they and they also said, yeah, definitely to the centrifuge, like dangle the carrot in front of me. And so, yeah, so so I took I took part in it and really kind of haven't looked back since the series it was it was brutal it was exhausting it was you know really tough sort of few months but I look back with such fondness on the experiences that I had and it sort of changed the trajectory of my career as well which has been quite interesting I can show you some of the stuff we did actually if you're interested in kind of seeing that maybe I can uh Maybe I can, uh, I don't know if that I would can do this. Awesome. Yeah. You exactly. might have to give you permission to share my screen, actually, Mark. Can you do that? Oh, yeah, let me do it real quick. Hopefully I haven't lost you. Um, yeah, so I guess what I'd say about it is we never knew what was coming. There's loads of unpredictability, and you have to just accept that you're going to be really rubbish at some things and be rubbish with grace, <laughs> you know, and accept that maybe you didn't do so well, try and improve. Yeah, I might have won the show, but I failed at plenty of things in the process. And the take home message there is no one's perfect. And uh, they're not looking for perfection. They're just looking for people that keep trying and people that learn quickly and are good all rounders. And so just I know it was a really long answer, like a 30 minute answer to your question. But interesting, just an interesting experience for me, really. That was a wonderful answer. And I have a follow up question. Um, so you talked a little bit about the reaction to failure, specifically with that the first challenge of hovering the helicopter. You were the winner, so obviously you had a good reaction. Um, I'm also thinking about the young girls who might be wanting to participate in the Space Prize competition. What advice might you have for them, and, and what was your way of dealing with failure that obviously was, was good enough to get you the prize? You no, know, I think me, 20 years ago, we'd have had quite a different reaction now because I used to think that that you had to be per like I was trying to be perfect <laughs> and I was never going to get there <laughs> and so failure would have been a really big deal to me I've taken it really personally you know and and I'd have been really upset by it I was never I'm, I've never been somebody that got angry about things I don't have an angry bone in my body I don't think but I would have got upset by it back a long time ago and these days I, I was rubbish. That's the first thing. I flew it. It was like a pendulum, basically. I was flying it like this backwards and forwards until we all started to feel a bit sick. And the instructor was like, we need to end this. Um, so, uh, but I think, I think that the thing they were looking for was some people got angry and frustrated at, or wanted to quit or just, you know, they couldn't contain their frustration and anger. And they're looking for people that just keep going. I was like, how can I do better? I don't understand what's going wrong. You know, help me improve. So positivity, I think, posit a positive attitude and not just quitting or getting frustrated or angry um, because it doesn't help trying to work through the problem, I think, is what they were looking for. That is great advice to give all of our young ladies and our, our young men who are, are interested in the space programs as well. Um, I want to get back to Anna's question because we didn't get a yeah. chance to let you answer that. So have there been any connections and overlaps between climbing experiences and your research? Yeah, massively. And actually, one of the most rewarding projects of my life has been when I managed to bring those two things together so bringing together mountaineering and and science because I'm a data scientist basically so what I do is take massive amounts of data and do science using that data and so um finding the new mountains using the supercomputer writing computer codes to to find mountains was so rewarding because it brought together my code experience my supercomputer coding experience and the fact that I wanted to find these mountains because I wanted to climb them. So I had this like clear goal that I was really fascinated in, really wanted to achieve, and the means of doing it through the scientific process. Um, and it, and it, it was interesting because we had to define what a mountain is. I mean, we had to start from the fundamentals. What is a mountain? How do you define mathematically what a mountain is? And it sounds easy, like it's just a lump, <laughs> right? It's just a lump that's higher than every other lump, but that's not the case. Imagine you've got a mountain, with a boulder on the side of it that's really high. At what point is that boulder a separate mountain? And at what point is it just a lump on the side of a bigger mountain? You know, those are the kinds of questions you have to start with. And we went back to first principles. How do you define, how do you define that mathematically? Can we define it in such a way that we can apply our definition across the globe to every mountain range? And historically, that hasn't been the case. There's been one rule for Wales, 
and I picked that because the mountains are tiny, one rule for um, Alaska, one rule for the Himalayas, and they're different. And one rule for the Alps, you know, they're all different. And so we made one rule and we applied it universally using this technique, uh, using the supercomputer. And then, and then, you know, being able to leave work for months at a time is not easy. So um, I managed to get around that by calling them research expeditions. So I would ask loads of scientists, like, what would you like? You, you probably can't get there. Not everyone necessarily wants to or can get to these really tough places. But like, what data can I bring back that will help other people with their scientific endeavors, if not me? So I did things like I went off to collect samples of ice and rock from inside glaciers in really remote regions where humans haven't been before. Bringing back the samples to the lab. We have a Mars lab, actually, and we're, we're designing instrumentation to look for life on Mars. And the kind of life we're looking for is bacterial life, these bacteria called extremophiles, which have evolved to survive in really extreme environments on the Earth's surface, knowing that Mars is extreme as well. So we were finding parallels with the kind of life we're looking for on Mars and testing our instrumentation. If we found a sample of an extremophile with our instrument, would we see it? Would we identify it correctly? Um, so yeah, those kind of projects, you know, setting off, taking measurements for other people, sometimes for myself, um, ground treating satellites, so making the same observation as the satellite on the ground. So I make a measurement that's really accurate place. Satellite flies over and makes another measurement in the same place, and we compare the measurements. We know the one I took is really accurate because I'm standing on the ground with a big instrument. And we want to say, how accurate was the spacecraft then? And if it was a little off, do we need to recalibrate the data that comes back? to take into account an offset that we've observed. So things like that um, were things that I did and it introduced me to a load of different scientific disciplines, interesting people doing interesting work that I wouldn't have been introduced to except for the fact that I was offering to go and collect some crazy data for them in the high Andes. So it was, it's been fun. That's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I think there are so many similarities to remote places on earth and how that relates to what we see in space. That's a really, a really amazing perspective. Yeah. Um, I got a little squeamish thinking about taking my own blood. And I also know that I get sick on those, you know, crazy rides and roller coasters. So what is one piece of advice that you want to share with some young people and people like me who might feel like they're not qualified to enter the space economy? And, and maybe what are some options for them to, to work in space that don't have to involve taking my own blood? and being in the <laughs> going underwater. <laughs> you know, that astronaut that you see that's doing that stuff, that astronaut is supported by tens of thousands of people on the earth doing amazing jobs that, that are directly relevant to uh, growing the space economy one way or another. And we need people, the economy is growing so quickly in space. We need people that do everything, whether it's people writing, journalists, architects, you know, whether it's space lawyers, there's tons of issues with space legislation at the moment that need to be dealt with. You know, we need scientists, we need engineers, we, we need everybody in all different sectors. There's probably a parallel job to the one you were thinking about doing in some other sector, in the space sector. That's probably cooler if you actually look into it. So I would say that wherever your skills are, whether they're mathematical or scientific or artistic or musical or anything in terms of law or society, it's probably a really interesting job for you if you start start looking a little bit further and in terms of not feeling qualified who does feel qualified to work in this sector right I mean it's like everyone thinks they aren't qualified to work even people like me I've been working in the sector for a long time and even I don't necessarily feel qualified to always you know know the answer it's not about always knowing the answer it's about you know any contribution that you can make and so I think it's unrealistic to, 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 to think that, that, you know, you definitely know you have a place there. It's about exploring where your place might be. And maybe it takes you a decade or more to, it took me that, that long to find where that place is and where that contribution is. So, you know, don't worry if you don't think you're good enough because I don't think anyone does. Thank you, Susie, for sharing that. Um, I have one more question I'd like to ask and then I want to open it up to see if there's other questions from our, our audience members. But what do you hope our multi-planet future looks like in a hundred years? That's a good question. Um, I know that you know for the last thirty years we've been saying in thirty years we're going to be on Mars, <laughs> and then like decade goes by and someone says in thirty years we're going to be on Mars. So you know that story is never ending. Um, but I actually think in thirty years we'll probably be on Mars. So you know, uh, I I think that's probably true. So um, but what I hope 
what I really hope is that we're a responsible interplanetary species. So I think we will be an interplanetary species, but I, I, I want, I hope that we're responsible about the way that we go about that. And that's things like, you know, adhering to planetary protection, making sure that we don't accidentally colonize Mars with tons of bacteria from the earth, for example, as we start to explore it and look for life there. Um, it's about thinking about the resources available to us in space and thinking about how those resources are accessible, making sure that it's not just the rich, powerful countries that benefit the most from access to space resources and, and space more broadly, and thus just accelerate the divide between rich and poor in the, in the world. Um, I think it should be about uh, not using space. I mean, think about Antarctica. We have an Antarctic Treaty, which talks about not exploiting Antarctica and not using it for military purposes. And uh, I, I would say, as a as a so from a scientific perspective, I'd like to see a, a similar way of 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 thinking about space. So we use it for the mutual benefit of all, for scientific purposes, and we we don't use it in any kind of aggressive military sense. Of course, here's an example of where that gets tricky. There's tons of space debris orbiting the Earth. There's millions of hundreds of millions of pieces of of debris that can be tiny or, or can be the size of a satellite orbiting the earth all the time just because we've been careless in the way we've treated near earth space over the years um this problem gets worse because the more things you have orbiting the earth the more bits of debris the more likely a collision the more bits of debris the more likely a collision so this problem's getting really worse and worse and worse and we track tens of thousands of these objects to make sure that we keep key assets like the international space station safe from collision um and uh, so we want to do something about it. We're developing technology that enables us to collect pieces of space debris in a net or using a harpoon system, deorbit large pieces of space debris that are out of control. So by grabbing it and bringing it down, could we could we somehow clear things up? But it's a massive mess. There's a lot of pieces and it's a huge endeavor. So things like, you know, who's going to pay for it? Obvious question. Um, but to build on that a bit more, not just who's going to pay for it, but as soon as you develop an asset that can go and capture another asset and bring it down, well, that can be used for space debris, but it can also be used in a hostile to remove the spacecraft from the Earth's space. So you can see that it's not as easy as saying you must not use it for aggressive purposes because some of the things that we're doing have two sides to the coin. And so there's sort of interesting ethical arguments around, around the way that we behave. And so, you know, I'd like to, I'd like to see and to hope that we behave responsibly and space becomes a place that, that benefits all of humanity. Um, and that means sharing technology, sharing infrastructure, sharing hardware with the rest of the world and not just building our own infrastructure for the rich nations that have the ability to do the launches and build the, build the hardware. So peace and love was the answer to that question. <laughs> that was a wonderful answer. Yes, beautiful. Thank you. Are there any questions from our audience? You can feel free to unmute. You don't have to put it in the chat if you have a question that you'd like to ask. Someone's a baker. I'm just reading the chat. Nice. Good. Love baking. Paul, go ahead. Share with us your question. Good evening, all. Oh, hey. sorry. Am I on mute? No, that's no, good. we can hear you. Fantastic presentation. Thank you, Professor Imber, very much indeed. Um, I'd just like to get your take, please, if I may, on the our, our social mobility SARS comments last week about uh, maths, uh, sorry, the hard maths putting off girls from choosing physics for A-level. You're blowing my mind apart by reminding me about that. So some people might not have heard about this, but um, there was a government advisory panel, I think, Paul, and they had an expert to, to give some, some testimony and they were basically saying that um, girls don't do physics because there's really hard maths involved and you know they don't like hard maths. And then the fact that only less than 20% of physics students at, at A level, which is our sort of pre-university level, physics is fine. We don't need to change that. It's just that they don't want to. Uh, and you know, this is incredible language to be using on a government advisory committee. And I think it shocked many of us to our very calls to hear. It's just outrageous, outrageous. Honestly, who is this person? Um, anyway, the answer is somebody without any knowledge or experience, I think in this particular field, she'd been a headmistress and she had experience in, 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 in running a school. But for those of us that work in this field all the time and are doing our best to try and change things, it was really frustrating. So 
Um, I know that there are hundreds of people out there who are trying to make change every day, whether that's, you know, when I finished the astronaut show, I went out, started a big outreach program and I spoke to about 50,000 kids in their classrooms. I drove all over the country, broke my car, broke my bank balance uh, and just decided to make it like a personal mission to talk to as many people as possible. Anyone who, is, who wants to listen basically and whether they're male or female or old or young. And, and I know there are, like, I was lucky because I had a platform to do that because I'd just be on the television and I had cool videos to show like the ones I showed you. But there are lots of other scientists who are doing exactly the same thing, like sharing their experiences and encouraging others. And to hear those words from that from that government advisor is, is heartbreaking. But I think all it makes us want to do is redouble our efforts and, you know, and say to the government, if you actually want to know the answer to, to the question around social mobility and how you get people from all backgrounds and um, and genders, ethnicities, you know, everything, all cultures involved, come talk to us, <laughs> like come talk to the people on the ground that are trying to do it. You know, I'd love a conversation to, to try to talk about this. And as an example, I started a scholarship program for, for, for people um, from difficult backgrounds at, at the university to, to do physics. And uh, I just finished a big program with primary schools, targeting primary schools in deprived areas. And so, you know, many of us have lots of programs working on exactly this, Paul, but it's, a, it's still a problem. You know, we still find that there are some regions and and some schools and some peoples that are hard to reach and we have to do more I think and we have to we have to design the outreach activities we do carefully and strategically to reach an audience of people that we can't reach any other way so maybe it's music festivals I talk at music festivals I'd never been to a music festival until a couple of years ago and I was like I love music festivals but I get to go talk science and, and reach a whole different audience of people and I do outreach programs with families um you know in li local libraries talking with families who are never going to encounter a scientist maybe in everyday life but you know just trying to show we're just normal people and your kid can do the same if they want to so you know the answer to your question is oh my goodness what a terrible statement I'm sure you agree with me Paul but there's lots going on to do our best to, 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 you know, spread the word. It's a great answer. Thank you, Richard Dees. You're welcome. A great answer and great question, Paul. Thank you for, for sharing that with us. Are there any other questions from our audience? Somebody sent one to me, actually. Thanks for your expertise. Can you discuss 2024 and 2030 planetary magnetic pole shifts? Uh, it, it was a it was a message direct to me actually rather than to the group. Uh, interesting. So I think you're probably I don't know actually 2024 and 2030 magnetic pole shift. So I'm going to stop myself from giving a massive planetary science lecture because we only have two minutes left. But the Earth's magnetic pole, the Earth has a dipole magnetic field like a bar magnet, and uh, this kind of blows my mind too. You expect the poles of the magnet to be opposite each other. But not only are they not opposite, but they're moving in different directions, at different speeds, which is kind of mind blowing. Um, and so one pole is moving really, the North Pole is moving really, really quickly in one direction, and the South Pole is barely moving at all, and uh, moving, moving, uh, not in the direction that you would expect. Um, so the poles are shifting; they're not, not, they're not flipping at the Earth. They're just, they're just moving around, um, and that's probably due to higher order components. So we think about a dipole. But there's also something called a quadrupole, which is four poles. There's an octopole component, which is eight poles. And we add all of the effects of these higher order components together to give us a total field. And the dipole is a strong one, but the little minor ones can have influences. So I think that's what that question meant. Although I can't resist but tell you that the sun's magnetic field flips every 11 years. So I think you're talking about the Earth's pole, whoever wrote me that question, but you might be talking about the sun. The sun's pole flips every 11 years, and that gives us some of the solar activity that I was talking about earlier, the changes in the variability in solar activity. Amazing. Cool. Thank you Any for more? sharing that. I want to learn so much more about <laughs> magnetic shifting and the poles and everything. <laughs> I know, so much just in that last 60 seconds. I know. <laughs> Sorry. No, oh, it's good. Appreciate that. Before I hand it over to Mark, I just want to see, are there any other questions that didn't get it answered? All right. Thanks. Well, thanks for having me. Thanks for inviting me this evening. Thanks so much for being here, Susie. It's really fantastic. And, and I, I know you know what we're up to, but so much of what you said was so on target for the, the young women we're trying to help and, and for students and educators in general, just such a great, great message around, you know, overcoming failure and <laughs> 
supporting each other. And, and uh, I think it's, uh, I think it's also valuable for, for kids to see somebody like you who has, you know, so many different parts to their personality. It's not that you're just a physicist, you're a climber and adventurer and so on. It's really um, inspiring for me to see <laughs> from my seat and I can imagine for, um, for a high school student. Um, before we, uh, we end the recording, I do want to say that uh, next week we will have a panel of three speakers from the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. So we'll be welcoming uh, Linda Shore and Vivian White and Teresa Summer. Um, this is, I, I think, well, they claim at least the oldest uh, astronomical society in, uh, in the world. So they've got a great tradition and they've got great outreach programs and they work with students uh, all over California, all over the world. So it'd be great to hear from them. But uh, so come back next week. We'll be uh, back on the West Coast time, I guess. It will be uh, 4 p.m. my time in California. You can you can figure out your time zone from there. Uh, but thank you, Susie, for joining us. It was nine o'clock for you. <laughs> uh, one o'clock here, I, th I think four o'clock for Leslie. Um, and, and we've got folks, it looks like, from all over, even in the small, uh, small group we've got here today. And we're so excited to have uh, your message recorded. And the earlier session you sent us a recording of, fantastic to be able to point people there too. So thank you for your generosity with your time. Thanks. And you didn't even have to break your car to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is easy. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Susie. Thanks, Leslie. Thank you, Susie. Bye, everyone. Bye, all.